Services for the work you've done there. Uh, it's the Trade Waste Bylaw, and I'll invite uh, Julia Harker, Paul Wilson, and Merle Smuts from Watercare to uh, to come to the table if you're all here. Um, normally, I would have asked Richard Hills to um, introduce this as the chair of the um, of the panels. Uh, but he unfortunately can't be with us today. So, um, Julia, could I ask you to introduce it, please? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the panel today is presenting its recommendations on proposed changes to the trade waste bylaw to the governing body. The panel members are Councillor Hills, IMSB Deputy Chair Glenn Wilcox, and Catherine Harland from the Watercare Services Limited Board. The Regulatory Committee completed a review of the bylaw in July 2018, and the governing body adopted proposed changes to the bylaw in March 2019. The proposed changes to the bylaw seek to better minimise risk by making the rules clearer for both the public and discharges and ensuring they are up to date. Uh, Council received 28 written and 30 in person feedback responses. The panel deliberated on the public feedback received on the 5th of July, and the panel's recommendations are summarised by topic in Table 1 of the report and in more detail in Attachment A of the panel report. The panel recommendations support the intent of the proposal and recommend minor amendments for clarity. The panel asks that the governing body approve their recommendations and adopt the bylaw as amended by the panel in Attachment C of the report. On behalf of Councillor Hills, I'm sure he would like to thank uh, IMSB Deputy Chair Glenn Wilcox and Catherine Harlan from Watercare Services Limited for their time. Uh, panel member is here to answer any questions about the deliberations and Watercare staff are also here to address any questions about the content of the bylaw or the proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Glenn Wilcox, I might ask you to make a, a comment as a, a panel member, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Following on from the original trade waste bylaws in 2013, the main thrust of this one was to add clarity and to make minor technical adjustments to this, uh, to this bylaw. One of the things that has come clearly to my mind is the confusion that exists with regards to trade waste and other types of waste entering the water system. The trade waste bylaw is specifically with regards to what goes down the sewers. It has nothing to do with storm water, except in a certain special circumstances. And so a lot of the, unfortunately, a lot of the submissions were confused as to what actual trade waste was and whether trade waste was actually going directly into the into the water system without going through um, being um, processed. And I suppose the other thing is it, it's a protect, the trade waste bylaw is a prote protects water care from people and from organisations throwing down things like radioactive substances, etc., etc. Uh, so that is one of the purposes of the trade waste bylaw. The other thing that did come up, of course, was that there seems to be a gap between notification that an organisation is working through the trade waste bylaw and when the premises changes uh, function, and then in that case, actually, it's still regarded as being a trade waste contributor or vice versa, where, an organ where it, doesn't, it isn't a trade waste contributor but is actually delivering trade waste to our sewage system. So I think these are the two main things. I commend the recommendations to you, councillors, and that's it. Move, Mr Chair. Thank you. It's uh, been moved. I'm happy to second that, and we'll uh, just open it up now for questions. I think it's pretty straightforward, like... Uh, uh, not like the last item. Uh, any questions? Uh, Deputy Mayor Cashmore. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, my question is concerning the actual actioning and performance of this bylaw. And that's, you know, we have a, um, a national body called the New, um, New Zealand Trade Waste and Industrial Waters Forum that's working around New Zealand to try and get a uniform approach across the whole country. Um, 
Were you approached by them and do you see merit in what they are suggesting and if so, how will that be implemented by this bylaw? Yeah. Um, the um, Industrial Trade Waste Forum use the Code of Compliance for the Liquid Waste Hazardous Contractors and um, they prescribe a particular software product called Waste Track to track waste. Um, that is just one product out there and I think generally from councils around New Zealand, as well as water care, we prefer to um, use an application that's more suited to our own purpose rather than a prescribed um, program. Um, and th that's what we're looking at at the moment, to try and we'll, we'll do the monitoring of that trade waste movement through the agreements rather than through the bylaw. Secondary point, Mr. Matthew, and how are you going to measure the performance of what you come up with as compared to what potentially be offered on a nationwide program? It will be fit for purpose. Um, at that, the liquid waste contractors have got waste track for themselves. We would rather put the onus on the trade waste customer to ensure that his waste is being either put down our lines properly or via a waste treatment facility and that's what we're working on. So it's more to do with the trade waste customer as opposed to another level of regulation almost on the liquid waste contractors. So the contracts, the people handling the waste will be using waste track, a version of that to yes. make sure it's yes. basically well to go monitoring. Exactly. Right. It'll, it'll be one, one way of them proving that their waste has gone to the right place. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Shall we come to comments? Oh, sorry, is a question, oh, Councillor Just a Cooper? comment. A comment. Let's uh, open up the comments I, and then Councillor Cooper. I just wanted to use this time to acknowledge um, Councillor Hills for taking this on, um, but also, um, more specifically, Member Wilcox. Just as a member of the regulatory committee and just about every bylaw that's going, I just wanted to publicly acknowledge you, Glenn, um, because you are probably the hardest working IMSB member. You are always doing you, your duty by this region, and I really want to applaud you for that. Um, you're always willing to put your hand up, even though you're busy, and you are a great decision maker and a great um, person to work with on a panel. Thank you. Thank you. I think that, that is uh, endorsed around the table. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Glenn. So. I'm going red, I think. <laughs> Right, if there are no further comments, I'll put the recommendations. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no, and carried unanimously. We come to item number 13, which is the report from Audit and Risk on Auckland Council's top risks register. So if I could ask uh, Shivali Kukreja, uh, Cecilia C and Jazz Singh, please, to come to the table. So, Shivali, are you you're leading on this one? Yep, great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Shivali Kukreja, and I'm the Principal Risk Advisor. I'm here to present the Council's Top Risk Report, which was considered at the Audit and Risk Committee on 5th of June. The ARC has um, referred this report to the governing body as a standard agenda item. Council's Stop Risk Register is used to document the potential risks facing Council that could have a negative impact on Council achieving its objectives. It also includes high-level details on controls and mitigations that are in place or need to be further developed to manage these risks effectively. It helps senior management and other key stakeholders to have quality risk discussions, review and challenge the effectiveness of the controls, and to make effective decisions. The quarterly review of the risk register was completed in May. The review did not result in any new risks being added. However, a number of changes were made to the risk description, causes, controls, and rationales to better articulate the risk descriptions and controls. On 28th of Feb, the governing body had passed a resolution to prioritize the deep dive of climate change and readiness risk. The risk team completed phase one of this review in May. 
and this resulted in raising the risk rating for this risk from moderate to a high. The outcome of the deep dive review was presented at the Environment and Community Committee workshop yesterday. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I'll move to put the motion on the table, uh, seconded by Councillor Ross Clough. Uh, questions? Uh, Councillor Casey. The risk that we just discussed during the dog bylaw item in, in that staff go out into the public arena and frequently receive verbal, not physical abuse mainly, but verbal abuse over the airwaves, over the social media. How is that written into here? Because I, you know, I had a quick look through this and it doesn't... The only way you would get to know that is if you were on their shoulder, as I was. I, I, Ollie, you, you, you're going to address this in the next item, so we can either address it here or in the next item, depending on what you think is more appropriate. I'm, I'm quite happy to. OK. I'm quite happy to address that now. Um, so yeah, it is a considerable sort of risk factor that we that we are aware of, and obviously, as you will see in the in the upcoming health and safety paper, that we do have uh, quite a substantial uh, amount of incidents that we record on our system around uh, assaults, uh, ranging from verbal to actual physical uh, assaults at times. Um, it is something that we're aware of. It is something that obviously we expect the uh, the people who are who are planning these projects. Uh, do factor into their planning, so the expectation and the uh, training that's available for all these people, leaders to access for the people, uh, cover everything from de-escalation training to conflict resolution. And there's also a, a perception they will do a risk analysis in terms of understanding what the heat around some of these issues are, and if they're expecting to go into a situation like that, there are mechanisms corporately for them to access corporate security, and we can we can deploy security guards if, if that's if that's needed for that event, and that's only something that can be done. Uh, by by the person sort of leading that project. So that is the expectation of what is set from there. Um, whether that's always followed or not, I, I can assure you where, whether it is. Um, the other thing that we are currently uh, planning at the moment is in acknowledging the, the high level of assaults and, and, and verbal abuse that, that our people do get as they go about doing their jobs, is we're currently sort of sourcing um, a campaign through a PR organisation called Colenso with our, in, in, in cooperation with our communications department, uh, which is basically around trying to run uh, a, a proactive, outward-looking um, sort of campaign to our service users around understanding that we are here to serve them and we do expect to be treated with respect. What that looks like as a campaign, I don't know yet. It's currently being uh, formulated. Uh, we are currently setting up meetings and sort of workshops with our staff so that they can verbalise to, to these people, what they feel, how they feel, so that we can come up with a with a, with a humanistic way of really addressing that issue. Um, we want to go beyond the just treat our people with respect. We want to make it hit home that we are there doing Aucklanders work, and they are our Aucklanders. So we're all Aucklanders together. And I think that's the that's the ethos of the campaign that we want to break to the table. It's very good to hear. Yeah, it's a. Uh... We may touch on it under the health and safety. It is a, a, an issue of concern. I was talking to Auckland Transport yesterday, and they are also getting, uh, at the board and at the management and the staff level, threats that include death threats. And it, it is totally unacceptable, and nobody in the course of their job should be, should be required to put up with that sort of form of abuse. And I think whatever way we can implement a zero tolerance uh, approach to people being abused and threatened, and sometimes physically abused. It's not just in our area, you're seeing it in the hospitals with the nursing staff. Uh, it's just got to be, from all of us, zero tolerance. It's just not acceptable. Right, uh, next question, Councillor Walker. Sure, so uh, got a few questions, and they go to the, um, to the section on um, climate change adaptation and, and mitigation. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, does this apply just to Auckland Council or, or are we talking about the whole group? Um, through you, Chair, this risk register applies to Auckland Council and the risk in this risk register also applies to Auckland Council. However, as part of the deep dive review process, which we broke down into three phases, phase two of that um, review will look at 
our council, our CCOs, and how they are going to implement um, measures and you know activities. Sure, sure. Yeah. I thought so. Uh, I guess the concern that I'd raise um, as it goes to risk, particularly if we look at um, climate change adaptation and mitigation, while this is just dealing with Auckland Council, fundamentally we largely fund the CCOs. If we've got a likelihood that's almost certain, and that's one part of the risk equation, which is probability times magnitude, so almost certain is as high as you can get, and the magnitude is colossal. I mean, it's unthinkable in terms of um, particularly what uh, the cost... Excuse me, Councillor. Um, can I take this as your... Um, we can move no, on no, to comments, no, but, this is, but um, so this is, if it's a question, please is, come to the question. This is a question. Okay, could so you please quite come obviously, to there is a huge financial risk to Auckland Council because we are meeting the financial obligations of almost all, well, with the possible exception of water care, of our CCOs. Um, so are we, are we factoring that financial risk to Auckland Council into our risk register? What I'm driving at is the CCOs inherently are part of our risk, even though... Um, Technically, this document doesn't factor that in. Through you, Chair. Um, yes, this is an Auckland Council risk register, and yes, we have the financial risks from the CCOs. They provide quarterly risk updates to the Audit and Risk Committee on their risk management activities and mitigations and how they are tracking against their objectives, as well as every um, six months they provide a financial update on their performance and how they are managing the um, finances of the CCOs. Yeah, so. Got another question. Um, looking at the column in the right, where the residual likelihood is almost certain, the residual consequence is moderate, but the residual risk is high. I would have thought that the residual consequence would also have been high. We, we addressed this yesterday, um, Councillor, where the moderate, and it's a fair question you've raised, moderate applies to the next 12 months. It doesn't apply to the next 10 years. So it's a time frame rather than uh, an impact of climate change because the climate change impact will be high, if not extreme. But I think that's, from what the, the discussion we had yesterday, this relates to a very narrow time frame period, the immediate future, not the, the medium term future. Uh, but maybe officers can uh, I still that. don't understand through, that. Um, through, um, here we are. Through yep. you, Chair. Um, the, the likelihood is almost certain and the residual consequence is moderate. The way we rate our risks as per our risk management framework is we are looking at the impact on our objectives. So it is not really talking about the impact of climate change on communities, but it is talking about the impact on our objectives and how much it can impact us achieving our objectives that were defined uh, in our Auckland Plan 2050. So this moderate rating is saying that if the risk were to occur, at current point in time, the impact on our objectives is moderate because of the current level of information we have and the impacts of climate change currently being localised uh, to our communities, um, ecosystems, environment, etc. I, I think the, the issue I'm raising, Mr Mayor, is that unlike many other issues, it's the decisions that we're making today, particularly around the long-term nature of our assets, that are locking in our future. So we might make a decision um, tomorrow through RFA, through Auckland Transport, through Auckland Council around some project, but that decision today is locking in the consequences in many tomorrows. And we start, and we need to start sheeting home the consequences now, because we're actually internalising those consequences now. We may not appreciate that, but effectively we are. 
Councillor, um, so we'll, move, it, we'll move now to comments. So I'll, I'll give you the first call on comment because this is effectively what you're doing now. So please, uh, you, you've got the call and you can comment and we'll move to see if others have got comments after that. Thank you. So um, I'll make my comment and that is that as far as, first of all, risk is concerned, especially financial risk, that it's very clear that we are taking on the risk of many of our CCOs and those risks are substantial. What follows from that is that it is critical across climate change adaptation and mitigation that we have a huge amount of synergy across the council group. Otherwise, our opportunity for failure will be huge. The other comment that I'm making is that unlike many other issues, we are locking in the future today so the decisions that we make on an ongoing basis, we need to start internalising now as it goes to likelihood, residual consequence and residual risk. So there's a, a different way that we need to think about this particular issue because it is unlike most others. And I'd suggest that officers need to apply themselves to that across the matters that I'm raising. Thank you. Um, I think we all had a pretty good whack at this at a couple of different workshops tomorrow, but if there's any other comment that people would like to make now, I can take it. Otherwise, I'll, I'll, this is a noting recommendation. Um, and I think we're all pleased that the observation has been made that this is high risk and that's what we regard it as. If there's no further comment, I'll put the recommendation. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no carried. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Ollie to come back to the table for the second report referred from Audit and Risk, which is the Health and Safety Performance Report for quarter three of the last financial year. Ollie, it, it's, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'd like to introduce Shane Lewis, uh, who joins me today. Uh, Shane is the Occupational Health and Safety Manager. He actually leads the advisors and the officers delivering a lot of the work. So I thought it'd be prudent to come and put a face to a name and introduce you to, uh, to Shane. Um, so thank you very much for, uh, for having me here today. The report, again, as per all the standard um, uh, health and safety update reports, uh, as, recommend, as referred to from the Audit and Risk Committee. Um, just guarding through the exact summary, uh, three real quick points that I want to make to you. Obviously, the first one is that in terms of the health and safety division, the strategy that we are actually making good progress across that strategy. Um, our LTIs um, are sort of really kind of getting quite static. They have increased a little bit, but in terms of the severity, um, it's not anything unusual. Um, but the real focus is around sort of the, the SAFE 365, which is the capability score. So this is what groups together everything that allows us to really look at health and safety, not just the failures which health and safety normally likes to look at, but actually the, the, the ability for us to respond to incidents and, and the training that we give our people. And that's tracking quite favourably. So we had set a target of 60%. Uh, at the end of June, uh, we have fallen slightly shy of that target uh, of 52%. Um, our next milestone for that is at the end of the calendar year uh, 2020, where our strategy uh, finishes up. And again, we're hoping to, to increase that 60% to 75 So we're, we're currently tracking uh, well towards it. And just by context, just give you a, a sort of um, a, a bit of a context to that score. When we first started this journey, we were at 36% back in 2017. So we've made a considerable sort of uh, leap forward forward in, in, in how we manage our health and safety at council. Um, I think you could argue that we're, we're heading that sort of that plateau now where, you know, all the, all the relatively easy fixes have been done in terms of the systems and the processes. It's the application phase and the cultural phase that we're up against now, which is always a little harder to, to, to move on. Um, just moving through the report, just something I want to highlight to you is around table two. Um, hopefully you've received a, an updated table. The one that went out on the original agenda uh, was wrong. The arrows didn't um, match uh, the numbers, so apologies for that. Um, what this table is trying to give you uh, an, an idea and a sense of is that we're really trying to focus on our critical risks. Um, so minor injuries and everything else are very important and we do track those and we do act on those. However, the real risks to counsel, the financial risks, the reputational risks all arise from what we term as critical risks. And as we said, critical risks are those which have the potential to cause uh, major uh, life-changing injury uh, or death. So that's something that really council needs to be tracking. And the table really gives you an idea 
of all the critical risks that are out there within council operations. Um, again, we've been gradually building this, li this list over the last uh, year and a half. Uh, we are now getting our reporting, as you can see, um, really starting to work for us, where we're starting to really see those reports coming in, those incidents li linked to critical risk, which allows us an opportunity um, or allows Shane's team uh, to, to, to have an opportunity to really go in and understand what the critical risks are, what the situations around it are, so we can try and prevent any major uh, injury um, coming uh, as a result of any of these um, issues. Um, again, uh, in, we've just had a conversation around violence, so again, we just uh, deep dive a little bit into the security incidents and what we're seeing across the entire uh, portfolio. So we are getting better at categorization, so we can see just how these incidents are happening and uh, what the uh, endpoints are. Uh, and then the other point in the report really is around the briefing around the third party accreditation scheme which council is looking to enter uh, which will allow us to really um, improve how we manage our return to work process in terms of an injury when our employees are injured um, that they are uh, looked after in a proactive manner and that we engage with them from from the very very beginning to, to ensure that we get them back to work as soon as possible uh, after that injury um, and in a bet in, and in a good state that they're looked after um, so I'm quite happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Ollie. I'll, I'll move the recommendations to noting report. Do I have a seconder? Seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Are there questions of Ollie? Uh, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, just a question I, 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 I bring up every time. Where, where, where's the reference in here to the, the mental uh, health and wellbeing? Yes. Um, through the Chair. So the you see the work-related stress um, sort of uh, indicator that we are tracking. Um, the piece of work that we have been saying is coming is around the engagement survey, which we have already done. The analysis is currently being done on that survey, and that's the one that carries the question around the stress impacting around their me people's mental health and their workloads and everything else. So that I'm I'm hoping that, that will be before you at the next um, at the next council meeting. So, the the period of time since the last one is well over three three years from memory from when we got that rather disturbing revelation that there were over 20 per cent of the workforce you know uh, expressing some concern with the, their stress levels and anxiety and whatnot that's that's quite a that's quite a gap for for such a significant uh, concern that's been flagged to be reported back it is councillor so again just under the just under those three years we did the the initial wellness survey which was uh, completely focused on wellness and that gave us some results obviously we started off some processes around looking at our mental health procedures looking at the um uh, the mechanisms that we have in the organisation. We've since then we've rolled out the five ways to well-being throughout the organisation, uh, and we're starting to also put into our performance management systems, uh, the My Time system, um, elements around checking in with our people in terms of their well-being and mental health. We're trying to skill up our managers. So whilst nothing has happened in terms of the actual data, we did decide to wait for the engagement survey, which happens every year. Uh, this year, we, uh, when we went out with the engagement survey in April, um, we included some of the well-being. Uh, questions onto that. The reason why there was a gap is because we, we, we tried to basically do some value for money in terms of the exercises of how we used to do that. So the survey used to cost um, a significant amount of money to just do that survey on its own, whereas we've decided to combine that with the engagement survey, which does the same sort of mechanism going out to all our staff, uh, but is more aligned to the overall sort of cadence of the business. What we don't want to do is to hit our people with so many surveys that it, that in itself becomes a, a, a bit of a survey fatigue issue. So we're, we basically aligned it all into one, and, and that, that is for the delay, and I apologise for the delay. Okay, so, so, so thank you, and I, I do acknowledge the work uh, that, that you've been doing and made aware of. I guess what I'm saying is, as a you know, as a governor, my my main concern is what the people on the ground think, and they're, you're only going to find that out by asking them. So, I would just say again that with the disturbing nature of the last revelation, um, I hope that that analysis or that that feedback comes sooner rather than later because it's a long time between drinks. Yeah. Noted. Thank you, Councillor Casey. Two questions, Ollie. The first one relates to workplace violence. Can you tell me, that works out about like one, one violent incident a day, roughly, per working day. Can you tell me, is that in the animal management sphere or is it across, to, uh, please tell me it is. Um, it, we're actually seeing it across the entire 
uh, service portfolio. It's not just in the animal management sphere. Um, we tend to see some of the more um, some of the more serious ones in the animal management sphere because of the nature of the work that they do. Um, but what we are seeing is um, uh, what we would call low level drip 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 incidents of 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 verbal abuse coming into our libraries, our leisure centres. Um, anywhere where we interface with the community, it, it is something that um, I, I think we are subject to that, to that, to, to, uh, what do I say, that societal malaise almost, but we are bringing that into all aspects of, of everything we, that we do. Second question relates to the wonderful health and safety visits that we used to do, because I remember going to parks, libraries, and swimming pools. I can't remember anything since. It's been quite a long time since we've had one. Is there one scheduled or is that for the new council? They were great, by the way, great. Thank you. Um, we've actually, they have been um, open. We've had no takers. Um, so it is something that we do still run. Uh, we haven't had any takers practically come to us. Uh, we have sort of communicated that all the local board meetings that we do do this, um, no one has stepped forward. So I think that's a great call, call to action, Councillor. I think it's something that we, we will, I will push out again, and I would love to see some of those visits taking place. I think if you could see some of the stuff that's happening and some of the, um, some of the excellent facilities that our people run with the health and safety as a context, I think, I think it'd be quite an amazing sort of story that, that they would tell. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Thank you, I, I just want to take up the, um, the matter, a rather disturbing matter, about um, problems occurring in libraries, especially assaults and violence. Can can you explain a little bit more? Um, in t what, what would you like me to to try and explain? Is it the nature, or do you think as to why they're they're taking place? Yes, why um, are we? people behaving in this criminal fashion, fashion in libraries? So I, I think what we are, trying, what we are to, tend to be seeing is um, loads of different flashpoints for many reasons. So, for example, g generically, uh, at the central library, where we tend to get quite a, quite a few more, it's that sort of interaction with some of the homeless community that come in. Um, it's the overspill for, from some of, our, um, some of our people out there who are suffering from mental health um, conditions and they're coming into our libraries because they're, they're fully open, they provide a, an engaging space where people can do stuff. Um, again, probably in the mental health space, although I'm not qualified to say, but again, people sort of um, abusing our facilities in terms of uh, looking at things that they shouldn't really be looking at in a public library on the computer systems. Uh, when our staff step in to, you know, to, to basically enforce that, it's very much a uh, how they're feeling or what the person is experiencing at the time as to how they respond to our to our people. So it's, it's a whole interaction with that. Within the um, within the leisure centres, again, we're also seeing uh, some real rubs against the communities in terms of how they're used. So, for example, in many cases, we know that uh, a, a lot of people are dropping off their, their children at the leisure centre and just letting them crack on and, and enjoy the leisure centre whilst the parents uh, go off to work because it's, it's it's just a need for the community. Um, unfortunately, when our staff obviously challenge some of this behaviour and say, look, we can't really be in local parents of your children all day, there's a there's a parental responsibility, that does tend to lead to a to a sort of heated debate in many situations. So there's a there's a whole lot of issues as a result of of why it's, these happen. It's really dis disturbing because our library services in many ways the acme of um, civilization um, and our provision or support of culture can can we get a, a some uh, uh, information on on this trend to, to to watch it carefully to see that it's not increasing that that would be helpful I think absolutely all of those assault it's, there needs to be a trend over time to, to, because it's something we need to take responsibility for. Thank for you. sure, we can certainly give you that, that information, that trend data. Yeah, just add to that concern. I think you know libraries are areas where you think that you can send your kids to um, to enjoy some peace and uh, uh, and quiet, and they're safe. And if we are attracting to libraries people that have personal issues, including mental health, uh, that then very quickly could create an atmosphere where a library is seen as the, the converse of what Councillor Lee has been talking about. 
So I think we'll probably need to give some further thought to how we can uh, we can deal with. I know it's a, it's a very tricky situation, but uh, I'd, I'd hate to see our libraries degenerate to a space where people felt they weren't safe to go. Uh, not to mention the, the 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 implications for staff. Correct, and and I do want to just uh, re-emphasise. It's not saying that our libraries are unsafe. They are absolutely not. You know, for the majority of them, they're absolutely amazing. It's the point interactions that we are sometimes getting between some people coming to those libraries and our staff that is being reported. Obviously, across the region, you know, this does sum up uh, into into numbers. So I think we just want to make that clear. Thank you. Um, we have comments. If there are no comments, I will put the to noting paper. I'll put the recommendation. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. And carried. Um,